If you are, are new to Lake Merced or new-ish, then uh, you may or may not know that we are in the midst of a, a 50-week series that we're doing this year called Read Scripture in 2021. We're 29 or, or almost 30 weeks into that series now. And, and the goal of this is that we spend you know, 10 or 15 minutes each and every day reading through the Bible. And, and over the course of this year, we will have read through the Bible from cover to cover and really understand kind of the story of Scripture a little bit better. And so... Um, Ideally, if we've been doing that, we come on Sunday morning, and then the sermon that you hear is, is kind of derived from whatever you've been reading that week. So this is just the second time that you've heard all this this week. Well, this week we are, we are shifting back out of the Old Testament prophets, where we've been for five weeks now. We looked at Jeremiah, we looked at the book of Ezekiel, and now we're getting back into the, the historical books, the historical narrative, as we see the timeline of Scripture continue to march along. And we're in a, in a book, or a couple of books actually, called Ezra and Nehemiah for that. So if you have a Bible handy, or if you have a phone, or a tablet, or some other way to read, I want to invite you to open your, your Bibles up to the book of Ezra. If you would like a hard copy of a Bible and do not have one, back there behind our brother Austin. Austin, you want to raise your hand for me? There is a, a bookshelf there with all kinds of Bibles on it, and you are welcome at any time during service to get up and, and grab one of those but you're going to be, you know, roughly halfway through your Bibles in the book of Ezra this week. But as we, uh, we get started this morning, uh, we're going to go to God in a word of prayer. And uh, I'm redundant at this point, I understand. But uh, I really do hope that we, we approach the throne room of God with reverence during this time. And so as we come, as we prepare our hearts and our minds to hear God's word spoken aloud, uh, I want to invite us to consider our physical posture before God. Uh, how, how would you approach the president or a king or, or somebody else? Uh, you, you would, your, your physical posture would reflect who you were uh, talking to. And so I want to invite you to stand or kneel or raise hands, uh, something to show reverence to the Lord. Let's pray. Most righteous and heavenly Father, uh, we do not take this time for granted. What a blessing it is to come into your presence and to be with you. Father, this, this time that we have is sacred time because it's your word that we're speaking. And so, Father, as, as we, we jump in and we read Ezra, we re read Nehemiah, uh, Father, would you bless this time? Would you open our, our ears and open our eyes and open our hearts to be able to, to understand and discern and, and to really love your word? Not just hear it and kind of, you know, begrudgingly accept it, but Father, to really love your word, that, that we would be planted by streams of water. That, that is nourished and fed in every season, Father, because of how much we, we love and adore the, the word that you've given us. So, Father, would you bless this time together this morning? All of us, Father, help us to cast off those, those thoughts of, of what we're eating and what we're doing and, and what's, what's happening in the future and just be fully present, all of us, our entire selves this morning, right now. That's my prayer. And, and God's church said, amen. amen. Well, this, this may not be the first time I've, I've shared part of this story before, um, but we have enough new people. I figured it was, it was okay to, to revisit. Uh, you may or may not know that Tiffany and I were, were high school sweethearts of sorts. Uh, there's this day, I was in 11th grade, I walked into my biology class, and I don't know if I must have had bad breath or something, but I, I asked a girl for, for a piece of gum. And she didn't have any. But suddenly, this other girl wearing a cheerleader uniform just kind of spoke up and said, I have some gum. And so I, I said, okay. And I took it. And I, I said, thank you. And I didn't think anything of it other than that was really, really nice. But then, then something kind of, kind of wild happened. Something crazy happened that about 10 or 11 hours later, uh, I had just finished playing in my high school football game. And, and really by playing, what I mean is I, I stood on the sideline for three hours and I watched my friends play in a high school football game. Um, and then I, I got into my friend's Chevy Suburban afterward to, to go and, and have fun, what a lot of high school kids are trying to do on Friday nights. Not always the best kind of fun, but that's what we were doing. And so I got in Jack's Chevy Suburban and, and I, was, I was thrilled because I looked and it was me and him and six girls in the back of the Chevy Suburban, which is an incredible ratio for a high school boy who's, who's looking to have a good evening. Um, again, not the kind of evening I condone, but, but the kind of evening I was excited about at the time. And, uh, you know, so fast forward ahead a little bit later and me and, and him and like a hundred of our friends from high school are, are, are doing this evil loitering thing where we're standing behind uh, a store looking for something to do because there's nothing really happening. And all of a sudden, uh, 
everyone starts yelling, cops, cops, cops. And so we, we, if you've ever been in that situation, again, I don't recommend it, but if you have, you know what happens next. You, you run, you get in cars, and, and you try to drive away as fast as you can. And so we did. I, I, I ran, I got into Jack's car first. So I jumped in the very, very back to make sure that we had our escape well planned and we could get out of there as quickly as we, we possibly could. And so crisis averted, right? We got away. But as we're driving away, I look up and there's this familiar face sitting in the seat next to me in the back seat. It all happened so fast. I didn't realize what was going on. But it was like, hey, aren't you the girl who gave me gum earlier today? And it was. It was her. And then on Monday, this same girl starts walking with me from class to class to class. And I just think this is the coolest thing ever because, like, I just made a new friend. That's all I'm thinking. I was very dense. But I just, I, I thought I made a new friend. And it wasn't until several weeks later of this same girl walking me to class, class after class after class, day after day after day, she finally hold, hands me a note and my dense self finally figures it out. This is not someone who's trying to be my friend. This is somebody who's interested in, in something more, a, a relationship. And I never suspected a thing. That's how clueless I was. I don't know, guys, have you ever been that dense or clueless? That, that, was, that was me, so clueless. Now. Good news, four years later, I, I married that, that girl, and uh, she's in the nursery right now waiting for babies to come and see her. But, um, so I, I guess I didn't mess things up entirely, right? She, she stuck around, even though I was, I was so dense, I had no idea what was going on. And, and honestly, probably neither of us really had any idea what was going on. And so be, because of that, from that moment on until the next you know, four plus years later when we both said I do to one another, uh, there, there were all these, these twists and turns and speed bumps along the way that, that we encountered, which is a nice way of saying we fought a lot, all the time. We, we just fought and fought and fought. Uh, in fact, even after we said I do, we, we fought a little bit more, which will surprise nobody who's ever been married before, because that still happens even in marriage. And, and I share all of this for good reason, um, that, that I learned an awful lot about reconciliation in a relationship during that season of life. Because I, I tell you, we must have broken up for 20 minutes, like dozens and dozens and dozens of times. And you ever, anybody ever been there? You have those like 15, 20 minute breakups? Like, we're done. Okay, well, never mind. Um, but I did it so much that we began to spot a pattern. Uh, and so if you've ever tried to reconcile a friendship or a relationship or, or even a marriage, uh, there's a good chance that there were a lot of similarities in terms of what that looked like. Um, kind of immediately after reconciliation happened. And I'll explain what I, what I mean just from experience in my life. In my life, nearly every reconciliation that, that I've experienced had two key elements. Number one was the big grandiose promise or series of grandiose promises. And number two was like the season of being on our absolute best behavior. In other words, we say versions of like, I, I've learned my lesson. I will never do that again, or this behavior is totally in the past. And, and then, for, for some period of time, it is. Like, we do a really great job of, of not doing that thing, whatever it was that hurt somebody. And so maybe we speak more nicely, or maybe we're less lazy, or we're more romantic, or intentional, or thoughtful, like something, right? And we do that really, really well for like two days, or, or two weeks. Am I alone? Have we all been there? Um, but then what happens? after those two weeks or two days. We often go right back to some of the same old behaviors that we had before, don't we? And I'm just curious, have you ever experienced these kinds of things in any of your relationships? By a show of hands, is this, is this resonating with anybody? Okay, good, I'm, I'm glad I'm not alone here. Um, because I, I think this is very common. I, I think this is kind of part of our, our human sin condition, if you will. But, but coupled with that, that best behavior season of things, is often an attempt to change something. Often, often something about ourselves that, that may have caused this rift or this conflict to happen in the first place. And so we think to ourselves, oh, okay, self, uh, I, I need to get better at this thing that I'm not very good at, and so, so what do I need to do? We start asking that question, and so maybe we get introspective, and we start thinking, okay, well, if I do this, this, you know, we kind of try to solve the problem for ourselves, or maybe we, we seek advice from somebody who's older or wiser than we are, or maybe we, we read a book, or a blog post, or we watch a YouTube video, or a TED Talk, some, something that's going to give us inspiration, or maybe we even go seek out a pastor or a minister, but, but something that, that, that we try to do, we, we try to put this, this formula or this game plan together that says like, okay, if, if, uh, if I do X, Y, and Z, then I'm going to fix this problem. Does that make sense? 
if, if I do these, these three things, these four things, then I will have fixed my problem. At, le at least this is how I have often personally sought to, to improve things or fix things that, that I'm poor at in a relationship or in a marriage or whatever. But here's the thing. I, I can't tell you how many times I've tried to do that, and, and Tiffany basically said some version of like, Josh, I, I don't know what to tell you. Like, this is, this is, there's no formula for this. In other words, this is a relationship. This is not computer software. This is not a recipe. There's no magic formula that, that suddenly makes everything better and, and fixed and, and go away. Uh, it takes more than that. It, it takes more than just a few programmatic tweaks to, to grow in, in this facet of, of our lives, your life, whatever it might be. And I know that in my heart. I, do, I know that right here. I know that in my heart. But in those moments where, where things get tough, what, what happens in my head is often very different than what happens in my heart because my head constantly goes back to just trying to push the right buttons. I, I, I'm a 90s kid. I grew up playing video games. Like if you press A, B, B, A, start, like something incredible happens, right? And so I, I try to approach relationships that way sometimes. And what, what Tiffany has had to try to help me understand from time to time in those programmatic moments is, is probably what many of you figured out long before I ever did, that there's something intangible about loving relationships. There's something intangible about them, uh, and, and they're not satisfied by, by magically just plugging in these certain behaviors at certain times to get certain results. Uh, there's a, a sociologist, an author, professor named Maury Schwartz, and he said it like this. He said, there is no formula to relationships. They have to be negotiated in loving ways with room for both parties, what they want, what they need, what they can, what they can do, and what, what their life is like. He says, in business, people negotiate to win. They negotiate to get what they want. He says, maybe you're too confused uh, or too used to doing that, but he says, love is different. Love is when you're as concerned about someone else's situation as you are about your own. In other words, growing in relationship has to be at least as much about the other person as it is yourself, and I would argue, I think, that it, ideally it has to be even more about the other person than it is yourself, uh, if it's really gonna thrive the way that God designed relationships to thrive. And, and I'll be the first to admit, I don't always do a very good job of that. In fact, I often do a very poor job of that, but that's what I believe to be true. And so what does all this have to do with the book of Ezra? Well, as, as you'll remember, these last four or five weeks, We've been looking at, at various prophets, and, and there's this moment where, where God and his people, much like a relationship, have kind of broken up, and God has essentially packed up, and he's moved out of the house. He's, he's moved out of the temple. His glory left, and the people were exiled to go live in this foreign land of Babylon, and not only that, but the Babylonians came in and ultimately burned down the temple and the city. So there is no more Jerusalem. There is no more temple. Those are all destroyed, and so that's the bad news. The good news is what we talked about the last two weeks, is that the, the prophet Ezekiel began to speak and tell all the people about these visions he was having, that God was showing him this, this picture of hope and restoration. He says he saw these visions of, of dry bones coming to life again. He saw a vision of a new city. He saw a vision of a new temple. And all of these things are, are getting the people really excited and hopeful about what one day might be able to, to be re their reality, that the one day they'll be able to go home again and right their wrongs. They're excited for that. They're excited to go back and, and be on their best behavior and, and give all these grandiose promises to never do that again, to never worship other gods again, to never abandon God's ways, to never take Jerusalem and the temple for granted. Do you follow me? Like, this is what they're trying to do. Like, we want to go back. We want this, this opportunity once again. And so the book of Ezra is, is about that. It's about that. Now, quick background. Ezra is not actually just Ezra. Uh, originally, Ezra and the book that comes right after it, Nehemiah, were part of one book. So Ezra, Nehemiah, same book. And so this morning, we're going to look at, at Ezra and Nehemiah together, at least kind of thematically, and we're going to try to cover both. And while I would love to go into all the, the depth and detail that's here, and, and trust me, there's so much to unpack in Ezra and Nehemiah, I, I understand that we don't really have the, the time for that, and you'd probably appreciate if I didn't just babble on and on and on. See, pun intended, Babylon, did you catch it? Babylon, yeah, okay. Bible jerk, joke. Um... So, as Ezra begins, 
a lot has changed from where we left off last week. In Ezekiel last week, there's one kingdom in charge, and it's, it's Babylon. Um, but Babylon is no more now. And it's about 60 years later since Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed. And Babylon has been conquered, and there's a new empire in charge. It's the empire of Persia, sometimes known as the Persians and the Medes. And if, if Babylon was modern-day Iraq, Persia would be modern-day Iran, just for a, some, some reference, point of, con, point of reference. And unlike Babylon, the, the Persian king Cyrus just happens to be, and this is, this is God's doing, but he has to, happens to be way more open to, to Yahweh worship and the temple than Babylon had ever been. So this is good news. And so we don't know a lot about what happened during this time frame, but we, we know that much. And we know that God had this hand in softening Cyrus' heart for their return, which to the people who were living in Babylon who remember Ezekiel's words, this would have, this would have sounded very much like everything Ezekiel said had come true. This is great news. And so Cyrus issues a decree. He says, the, the Lord, the God of heaven, this is Ezra chapter 1 verse 2, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Any of his people among you may go up to Jerusalem in Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem, and may their God be with them. And in any locality where survivors may now be living, the people are to provide them with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, with free will offerings for the temple of God in Jerusalem. And so the people do. They, they, they pack up all their stuff. Uh, their neighbors give them all their, you know, a bunch of gold and silver and, and goods and livestock, and they set out for Jerusalem. And, and Ezra tells us it's about 50,000 people that go. And when they arrive, what do you suppose their very first instinct is? Well, their first instinct is, is to have this big reconciliation moment. And so they want to be on their best behavior. They're trying to do things the right way. So they, they build an altar. And, and there they, they carry out all the prescribed sacrifices from the law of Moses that they're supposed to carry out. This is kind of like that moment where, you know, your, your marriage is just about to have broken up, but you're allowed to come back and you, and you walk in the door with a dozen roses. This is like that, that, that I've made a huge mistake moment in the story. And when they're all done, they turn their attention from the altar over to the reason they showed up in there in the first place, which was the temple. And, and no sooner do they lay the foundation of the temple than something happens. They, they run into trouble. Like any good building project, frankly, around the country, but particularly here in the Bay Area, there's opposition to this building project from the locals. And so there's this new king in charge, and this king doesn't know much or care much about what Cyrus had said. This is King Artaxerxes. And Artaxerxes basically just squashes their efforts right there in a moment. He says, I heard rumors that you guys were troublesome and, and rebellious and all kinds of stuff. So no, you cannot build that temple. Go ahead and stop what you're doing. And so everything stops for a pretty long period of time, about 20 years, in fact. But eventually, Artaxerxes is gone. Another king comes to power named King Darius. And, and the, the people of God kind of do this ask for forgiveness, not permission thing that sometimes you're inclined to do. And they just start building. Hey, new king, we're, we're just gonna, we're just gonna start building right now. And suddenly people show up and they go, hey, what, what are you doing? What, who told you you could just go and build this temple? And so they don't give all the information. They give just enough to, uh, to help their efforts. They say, well, no, I mean, go look at the, the records. King Cyrus told us we could do this. Go look it up. It's in, it's in your history books. And so they do, and lo and behold, they're right. King Cyrus had said so. And so King Darius gives this, this awesome decree that I, I think is actually quite funny. First off, he says, okay, let them go and, and, and build the temple. Not only that, we're going to pay for it. But he says this. He says, oh, by the way, furthermore, I decree that if anyone defies this edict, a beam is to be pulled from their house and they are to be impaled on it. Just take a beam out of your home and impale you on a beam. And, uh, and, and for this crime, their house is to be made a pile of rubble. And so may God, who has caused his name to dwell there, overthrow any king or any people who lifts a hand to change this decree or to destroy this temple in Jerusalem. I, Darius, have decreed it. Let it, let it be carried out with diligence. And so they, they have the full support now, again, from the Persian king. And so they do. And about four years later, the, the people finally finish the temple. They celebrate it. They dedicate it. And, and there's something that's noticeably absent 
from this dedication moment. I don't know if you guys remember when the temple was dedicated, the first temple in 1 Kings chapter 8. But if you think about that, and you think about Ezekiel's vision of a new temple that we talked about last week in, I think, chapter 37, there's something noticeably absent about this new temple dedication here in Ezra. And that is, and this may mean something, it may mean nothing, but, but there's no explicit arrival of the glory of God when this temple is complete. I'm, I'm inclined to think that's, that's indicative of something, that that's of substance. I had conversations with other people who said, I'm, I'm not so sure. But nevertheless, the, the temple is completed, and, and Passover is celebrated, and the first of, of three kind of parallel movements of Ezra and Nehemiah is now complete. And I'll explain what I mean here in just a moment. So in Ezra chapter 7 now, a, a new movement begins anew. And this time the priorities shift to this, this second movement. They, they shift from temple to Torah. From temple to Torah. The Torah, as you may know or remember, is a biblical word for the law of Moses. We're talking about the first five books of the Bible, which is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That is the Torah. And so if you were going to compare the, 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 all of Scripture, the Bible, to like a building, well, the Torah would kind of be the foundation that everything else is built off of. That, that's the foundation of the building. And so I'm, I'm going to geek out on you for just a moment. When you go into the Torah... And you read Exodus, a story that, that many of us have read many, many times and are really familiar with. When God's people are captive in this foreign land of Egypt, what is that landmark moment when their status changes from slave people to free people? What happens? What, what's that called? What do we call that? Anybody remember? They take the lamb, the blood, and they put it on the door frames of the houses. What do we call that? Passover, right? That's that, that demarcating moment where they go from slave people to free people. And so what I want you to see in that is it's, it's no coincidence that when the people finish the temple, what do they do next? They celebrate what? Passover. Because this is their transition moment from exiles, people living in a foreign land, to now home, where the temple is. Like this is, this is home for them. You get what I'm saying? And so it, it harkens back to the foundation, to the Torah, and how the Torah relates to the people. And so in that Exodus story, after the, the Passover has happened, and, and you know, they, they kind of march out of Egypt, and they, they part through the Red Sea, what's kind of the next big moment on that Exodus story? Well, they end up at, at Mount Sinai, and Moses marches up the mountain, and what does God give him? The Ten Commandments, right? He gives him the law of Moses, the Torah. It's installed there. And so in Ezra 7, this restoring of the Torah moment has come. And, and you kind of read and go, okay, well, who is Ezra the man? Well, verse 6 says he's a teacher well-versed in the law of Moses. And so we, we don't have time to really get into it, so you'll just have to believe me a little bit. But, but Ezra is repeatedly kind of thematically put forth as this Moses-like figure for the people. Even down to like the day that he leaves Babylon to head to Jerusalem. He makes sure that he leaves on the first day of the first month. Why? Because that's when Moses and the people leave Egypt when they're, when they're leaving in Exodus 12. This is all very symbolic and all very intentional. And so Ezra comes to Jerusalem... And he starts the, the next wave, the next campaign, the next uh, re return and rebuild moment. And, and his focus is on restoring the Torah this time. Temple's done, let's focus on the Torah. And so Ezra's very, very careful to make sure that he does everything in all the right ways. Because, well, he's an expert in the Torah. That he wants to do this the right way. In fact, at one point, he realizes, hey, we don't have any Levites. And the Torah says we're supposed to have Levites carrying stuff. So he sends messengers back to, to, to Babylon to get some Levites to come so they do this the right way. And it's just, as things are just about to get started, and everything seems to be going pretty well, Ezra's getting ready to do his Torah thing, some leaders of the people come to him, and they say, Ezra, there's a problem. He says, what? They say, well, the people of Israel, including the priests and Levites, which is never what you want to hear, have not kept themselves separate from the neighboring peoples. 
with their detestable practices, like those of the Canaanites and Hittites and Perizzites and Jebusites and Ammonites and Moabites and Egyptians and Amorites. He says, instead, they have, have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and their sons and have mingled the holy race with the peoples around them. And, and the leaders and officials have led the way in his unfaithfulness. Now, I don't know if that, if that triggers anybody in here the way it might, considering everything that we've been talking about as a, as a country and community this, this past year. Um, and if you want to dig more into this, I, I highly encourage you to go back and listen to the sermon from July in 2020 when we, we talked about this then and unpacked this a lot more. But we have to remember the context when, when, when it's being talked about a holy race and all this stuff. What's happening in Ezra chapter 9? Well, Ezra has come as this Moses figure to restore the Torah. And so you have to ask yourself, okay, what did Moses say about these kinds of things in the Torah? Well, two things. In Exodus chapter 34, verse 15, he tells the people there, he says, be careful not to make a treaty with those who are living in the land. This is when they're outside of the promised land and coming toward the promised land. He says, don't make a treaty with all those people who are living there for when they prostitute themselves to their gods and sacrifice to them, then they will invite you and you will eat their sacrifices. And when you choose some of, of their daughters as wives for your sons and those daughters prostitute themselves to their gods, they will lead your sons to do the same. He says something similar in Deuteronomy 7.3. He says, don't intermarry with those people. Don't give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons, for they will turn your children away from following me to serve other gods. So I read those because I want you to understand what, what is Ezra thinking as people come to him and, and tell him all these things about the people of God intermarrying with, with the people of the land. Well, he's thinking about Moses' words in Ezekiel and Deuteronomy. And this is a big, big no-no because it represents God's people no longer living as holy people, as set-apart people the way they were supposed to. It represents them letting their guard down and beginning to put themselves in compromising situations where they could start worshiping other gods. That's a big no-no, right? God doesn't want you to worship other gods. He wants to be the only God that you worship. And so this is a wandering heart kind of, kind of thing. And so Ezra hears this, and he says, When I heard this, I tore my tunic and cloak. I pulled the hair from my head and my beard. Let me know how that feels if anyone wants to try that. And he said, I sat down appalled. Then everyone who trembled at the words of, of the God of Israel gathered around me because of this unfaithfulness, of the exiles, and I sat there appalled until the evening sacrifice. And so Ezra just sits, and he prays, and he pours his heart out to God, and he's basically saying, God, we, we are so guilty. We are so guilty. Like, we're so unworthy of this kindness you've shown us. You've, you've allowed us to come back in the land. You've allowed us to rebuild this temple, and look at us. We're doing the same thing we've always done. We are so guilty. I'm so embarrassed, God. But when he's done something interesting happens. There's a, a moment of hope, you might say, where the people come to Ezra and they confess all the wrongdoing. They say, Ezra, you're right. We, we should not have done what we did. We should not have been intermarrying with these other people and, and putting ourselves in compromising situations. You're right. And like an apologetic spouse, they, they do the very best thing they know how to do to kind of right their wrongs and, and fix the situation. And so they immediately go, okay, here's an idea. Why don't we take these wives that we've married and the kids that we've had with them and we'll just send them away. We'll just get rid of them. That, at least that way they won't, they won't be here with us and we can kind of do this the way God wanted us to do, which, you know, is not exactly what God wanted them to do. There was never, never a point in time where God said, hey, here's an idea for you guys. Send them all away. But this is what they did. And, and, it, and it came from the, I would say, the best of intentions, but it was, it was really, really poor execution. This is not the kind of thing that God would have wanted. In fact, when, in was it Micah, when, when God says, I hate divorce, a lot of people think this is what he's referring to. This is not what God had in mind. But that's how Ezra ends. That's the end of the book of Ezra, which might make you understand why, why Nehemiah is a continuation of there. It's a really weird ending for a book. But that wraps up the second movement, which is the, the restoration, the return and the restoration 
of the Torah, the law of Moses. And so Nehemiah begins now. And Nehemiah is the third parallel movement of, of, of returning and rebuilding something. And we'll talk about that in just a moment here. But Nehemiah is a Jewish man. And he's living as an official under the king of, of Persia in the capital city of Susa. And some men come back from Judah, from Jerusalem, to Susa. And they say, hey, Nehemiah, or Nehemiah says, hey, how's it going? How are things back in, in Jerusalem? And they say, well, not so good. He says, they said to me, you know, those who survived the exile, they're, they're back home in the province, but they're in great trouble and disgrace because the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. And so Nehemiah says, man, when I heard these things, I sat down and I wept. He says, for some days, I just mourned and mourned and mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And his prayer is that, that God would give him favor before the king, that he's getting ready to go stand before the king. And so the next scene, there he is. He's with the king. And he says, the king asked me, and why, why would a king even pay attention like this other than the hand of God? I don't know. But the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you're not ill? There's nothing wrong with you. Why, why are you so sad? He said, this can be nothing but sadness of heart. And so Nehemiah says, I, I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? And so the, he says, the king said to me, well, what is it that you want? He says, then I prayed to God of heaven. I just said a quick prayer really fast. And I answered the king. I said, king, if, if it pleases you, and if your servant has found favor in your eyes, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are, where they're buried, so that I can rebuild it. And so the king says, well, okay, how, how long do you think you'll be gone? He tells him, he says, yeah, sure, go ahead. And what we, we quickly realize is that there's, this is the third of three parallel movements. We didn't mention the names Zerubbabel or Joshua, but, but they were kind of the first wave. And they came in and they helped rebuild the temple. And then Ezra comes in, and he helps return and restore the Torah. And now, Nehemiah is being sent to return and rebuild the wall. And the wall is important because the wall makes Jerusalem possible. There is no city without a wall back in those days. The city wall is, is critical to the survival and the defense. And so what I want you to see is temple, Torah, wall. Say that with me. Temple, Torah, wall. These are the three parallel movements of Ezra and Nehemiah. And so, much like the others, Nehemiah is rebuilding a wall. And things go well sometimes, and they go poorly sometimes, but eventually there's a moment of success, a moment of completion, a moment of dedication where the people celebrate. And everything seems good. The, the wall is done. And in Nehemiah 7, you, you get this list of all the exiles who'd, who'd returned to the city. And ironically enough, if you've been reading Ezra and Nehemiah, you might have noticed that Nehemiah 7 and Ezra 2 are like the exact same thing verbatim, which tells you something. It, they, these two accounts of the list of people who return form bookends. It, it's one complete unit. And, and that's on purpose. And so Nehemiah 7 comes to an end these three parallel return and rebuild themes have been developed, and, and the rest of Nehemiah continues. In Nehemiah chapter 8, Ezra does what Ezra does, and he, he begins to share the Torah with all the people. He recaps everything the Torah says. In Nehemiah 9, the people confess their sins and the sins of their ancestors. This is all very encouraging. You're right, Ezra. We, we, need, to, we need to change some things. We were wrong. In Nehemiah 10, that the people make a binding agreement to live according to God's ways. This is a grandiose promise. Hey, we're, we will always do things the right way from this point forward. We have learned our lesson. We will never do that again. In Nehemiah 11, the people begin resettling in the city of Jerusalem. This is, they're going to be on their best behavior. They get to come home, and this is their season of, of being on their best behavior. Nehemiah 12, the Levites come back to work. The, the people who are supposed to work in the temple, and they start doing their thing. The wall is dedicated. Everything is good. Everything is good. And if that was where Nehemiah ended, it would have been a fairy tale. It would have been a, a Disney story, a happily ever after moment. The people are back. Everything's been restored. Everything's good but it's not. There's one more chapter. 
And in Nehemiah 13, the text begins like this. You can read with me if you'd like. On that day, the book of Moses was read aloud in the hearing of the people. And there it was found written that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever be admitted into the assembly of God, the, the temple, because they had not met the Israelites with food and water, but had hired Balaam to call a curse down on them. This is all hearkening back to uh, the story of Balaam in Numbers chapter 23. And so it says in verse 3, when the, when the people heard this law, they excluded from Israel all who were of, of foreign descent. He says, before this, Eliashib the priest had been put in charge of the storerooms in the temple, in the, in the house of God. And he was closely associated with a guy named Tobiah. And, and he provided Tobiah with a, a very large room that was formerly used to store grain offerings and incense and temple articles and also tithes of grain and new wine and olive oil prescribed to the Levites, musicians, gatekeepers. So basically he says, I, this guy, Eliashib the priest, gave Tobiah this, this room that was supposed to be used for something else for him to use. And so what's Nehemiah getting at? Well, well the issue here is that Tobiah is, is, is a foreigner. He's definitely a foreigner and, and likely an Ammonite, which means there's a law against this. He's absolutely not supposed to be having to do anything in the temple. And so Nehemiah hears about this. He's not in Jerusalem. He's gone back to Susa. He gets word about this, and he's, he's frustrated. He immediately heads back to Jerusalem. And he gets there, and he says, I was greatly displeased. And I threw all of Tobiah's household goods out of the room. I gave orders to purify the rooms. And then I put back into them the equipment of the house of God with the grain offerings and the incense. In other words, I, I kicked him out and put everything back the way it was supposed to be. But he looks around and he realizes that's not the only thing that's amiss. He realizes that the Levites, the people who are supposed to be working in the temple, who receive their livelihood from the gifts that are given at the temple, were not receiving enough contributions for them to survive. And so they had taken side jobs out in the fields to make ends meet. And so Nehemiah says, in, in verse, chapter 13, verse 11, he says, So I rebuked the officials, and I asked them, Why? Why is the temple, why is the house of God being neglected? But he's not done. He looks around, he sees other disturbing things. He says, he looks, and, and men are, are, are making wine, and they're, they're selling food, and they're bringing in fish and merchandise, and all of that's fine, except when you're doing it on the Sabbath but they're doing it on the Sabbath, on a day where the Torah is quite clear that they are to rest, they are to honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. And so Nehemiah says, I rebuked the nobles of Judah and said to them, what is this, this wicked thing that you're doing? Desecrating the Sabbath day. Didn't your ancestors do the same things so that, so that our, our God brought all this calamity on us and on the city? He says, Dad, didn't we learn our lesson? Isn't this the same kind of stuff that we got in trouble for to begin with? What are you doing? But even after he comes down on their behavior in the city, on the work that's happening on the Sabbath, he looks, well, first he goes and he closes the gates to the city. And he says, like, we're going to rest. No, no one's coming or going. We're going to take this day off the way we're supposed to. But he looks outside the city. And there camped along the walls are these merchants who are doing business there instead. He says, so he went to them and he says, I, I warned them. I said, why do you spend the night by the walls? If you do this again, I will arrest you. Or other translations say, I will put hands on you, which says something a little bit more aggressive than I will arrest you. I know we're covering a lot, but I'm just curious. Do you see the imagery there? Temple? Neglected. Torah? Disregarded. Walls? Dishonored. And he's not done. He says, oh, oh, by the way, I see that people are intermarrying again. And they're, they're having kids that don't even speak our language. They don't know anything about us. And all Nehemiah can do, as, as the book draws to a close, is sit down and pray to God. And he just says, remember me, oh God. Remember me with favor. It's like he's saying, I've, God, I've, I've tried. I've tried everything I know how to do to get these people to understand how important this is. And they, they don't care. Father, just don't hold it against me, please. Like, remember me. I'm, I'm trying so hard here. And that's where Nehemiah ends. 
I want you to go back for just a moment and, and reflect on where we started. The, the two elements of every reconciliation story involve what? A grandiose promise or promises and a season of being on your best behavior. And so in Ezra and Nehemiah, God opens the door for reconciliation. He opens an opportunity for the people to have everything that they wanted to have back. He's like the, the, the spouse who has been cheated on, who allows their, their husband or wife to move back in and try to forge a new future. It's like, this is tough, but we're going to try to make this work. This is that moment where God kind of allows that to happen. And the people come in, and they give many lofty, grandiose promises. And they lived, even for, for some period of time, on their very best behavior. But what happened ultimately in the end? The people just ran back to all of their old ways of life, all their old behaviors. And in just a brief moment in time, this old familiar cycle reared its ugly head once again. And so here's what I want you to see. Here's what I think Ezra and Nehemiah is showing us. It's that the people of God and all of their high hopes of reconciliation and second chances had misplaced their priorities. They, they, they did what, what I often do when I've hurt someone I love, like, like Tiff, for instance. They looked for a formula. They looked for a secret sauce. They looked for, for the, the recipe, for the program that would turn their fortunes and make everything all right again. What's, what's the secret order of buttons that we need to press to make God happy? In their mind, whether they realized it or not, all that needed to happen for God to bless them and forgive them and for everything to be okay was temple plus Torah plus walls. Temple plus Torah plus walls. If they had all of that, everything would be good. But just like if I tried to sit here as Tiffany was sharing with me how I made her feel and how I hurt her or something, and I said, well, I don't, I don't really understand what the problem is. I, I, did, I, I remember I hold your hand on Wednesday, and on Friday we like cuddled for a few minutes, and like Sunday I made you, I made you dinner, and it was like, you, you kind of liked it. Like, what, what's the problem? What would she tell me? <laughs> she, she'd say, so what? Those things are only nice when they flow out of relationship. Those aren't the kinds of things that make the relationship. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's like Maury Schwartz said, there's no formula to relationships. And so the people in Jerusalem had forgotten that God wanted to be their God. And he wanted them to be his people. That's all he wanted. And he let them come home. That's why he let them come home. But almost immediately, they made it about something else. They made it about a recipe. Temple plus Torah plus walls equals a relationship. If there's one thing I want you to get from today's message, it's this, church. Recipes never replace relationships. They never replace relationships. And I would love to say that, that we understand that so much better today than the people in Ezra and Nehemiah's day seem to understand that. But the reality is that we don't. Many of us don't. Many of us still approach God in all the exact same ways, like he's just some video game waiting for, for all the right buttons to be pressed, lest he smite us. How many of us approach God that way? But that is never what God wants from his people. And Jesus made this explicitly clear. He said it in Matthew 23. He's talking to all these people who are experts in the law of Moses. And he says, woe to you. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees. You hypocrites. He says, you are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. And when you read the Gospels, this is a conversation that Jesus routinely has. He's routinely looking at these people who were experts in the Torah, who lived behind city walls, who spent day and night in the temple courts. And he says, all of you guys are like whitewashed tombs. There's no life in you. There's no relationship. There's no true heart or desire for God. All you are and all you do is try to live according to some pattern or formula or recipe. Like, that's all God wants from you. And it isn't. Recipes never replace relationships. And the honest reality for us, church, particularly the American church, 
is that for far too many people, the only depth or, or substance of faith and relationship with God is trying to live according to some recipe or formula that they think is, it's going to, to keep God from getting mad at us. So we spend our time trying to make sure that we, we read the Bible enough. We make sure we read it every day. And we, we go to church enough, and we know enough, and we pray enough, and we, we give enough, that we don't eat the wrong things or drink the wrong things, and that church service looks just so. And the goal is to make sure that everything fits into this, this neat and tidy little box that never takes risks, that never steps out boldly, hopefully doesn't make God mad, and we always are, are looking to adhere to some particular pattern that we think God wants. Meanwhile, God is over here saying, what I really want is to be your God and for you to be my people. He wants a relationship with us. Would you point at yourself really quick? Go like this. He wants a relationship with you. That's what he wants. And I don't say what I say to tear down the important things that we do to build that relationship, like reading and praying and worshiping and so on. <coughs> but so many Christians live different lives Monday through Saturday. But as long as Sunday looks the part, we kind of act like we've cracked the code. And I got news for you, church. If you do all the right things for all the wrong reasons, you don't have a relationship with God. You have a recipe. That's what you have. <laughs> and he never wanted your recipe any more than my wife wants a formula for me. Because recipes never replace relationships. He wants you. And the question that, that we're confronted with, each and every one of us this morning, is, is do you want that kind of relationship with him? Do you in your heart of hearts want him too? That's the question you have to ask. Because this life isn't about doing all the right things in all the right ways at all the right times. This life is about knowing the one who makes you right. The one who makes you righteous in his eyes. And if you don't know him, if you don't have a relationship with him, Jesus says you're a whitewashed tomb. You're, you're pretty on the outside, but on the inside you're dead. You're dead. And so Jesus offers each and every one of us relationship. Jesus offers each and every one of us life. And if you are ready to step out of a recipe and into a relationship, then that is exactly what I invite you to have today. I want to invite you to stand where you are right now. And as we stand and we sing here in just a moment, I want to invite you to begin a relationship with God. I want to invite you to be baptized into his son and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and begin a journey with him that never ends because recipes never replace relationships. I don't invite you to a recipe today. I invite you to a relationship with the one who can change everything about your life for the rest of your life. And so I'm going to be standing up here in the front row as, a, as we sing the song. You can come talk to me then. I'll be in the courtyard after service. You can talk to me then. Uh, but as we stand and sing, I want to close with these words of blessing that come from the Torah, from the books of Moses, where Moses says, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Let's sing.